Well, uh, uh, you can see from the title of my talk, it concerns universality and statistical mechanics. And I hope to tell you um, something about what the interesting problems in statistical mechanics are, at least for me, and, uh, and the notion of universality, which is um, a very intriguing one, and um, for which we have some partial understanding, I would say. Uh, in high dimension, we, I think we understand things rather well. In two dimensions, we should understand things better, and we have some partial results there. Uh, where we really would like to have uh, good results is in three dimensions. That's the physical world where, of statistical mechanics. Unfortunately, there, the results are rather sparse. So uh, to describe universality, I first have to give you a sense for what a phase transition is, because uh, universality really concerns phase transitions. OK, so I will begin very generally with the notion, uh, with the example of a, a system of spins, um, which you can imagine to be plus or minus 1, on a lattice. You can imagine the lattice to be two-dimensional or any, any dimension, but uh, above 2 is, uh, is better for these purposes. And uh, imagine these little spins to be uh, like a magnet, and they interact. What happens is at a high temperature, these spins, uh, if you take a, a bar of magnet and you heat it up, the, the spins become all disordered, and you have no um, ma net magnetization in your system. It doesn't really act like a magnet. So at high temperature, these spins are disordered. They, they're they're uh, unaligned. And if I look at spin-spin correlation, in other words, what the spin at the origin does, uh, how it interacts with a spin far away, um, you have an exponential decay at high temperature. In other words, the spin at the origin is more or less independent of the spin far away. Uh, and uh, however, there's some, some residual uh, exponential decay. And this length here, LT, is called a correlation length. That's the length at which they're approximately oriented together. What is the order of LNT in terms of spacing between the... the, the I have a unit spacing here. No, but L of T, what is the order of L of T? How big it is? How well, I'll, I'll explain. That's, that's really the, the, the crucial thing. How does L of T grow and, and, and so forth as you change temperature? L of T will be very large. Uh, sorry, sorry, L of T will be very small when temperature is high. What is the small? What time? Like one, like one. Like one. Like one. Mm-hmm. And when the temperature goes to the critical temperature, this L of T is going to go to infinity. So the length is going to get very, very large. Uh, now, at low temperature, these spins are basically ordered. In other words, they all tend to line up, as it does in the magnet. And you get a magnetization, which I've indicated here. So the spin here and the spin here, they may be both up or both down, but they're aligned. So the spin, spin. So this is approximately 1. Not only is it positive, it's approximately 1. And the spins are ordered. Now, I'll define these expectations more carefully in a minute. But at the moment, I just want to give the general picture. <coughs> yeah, yeah. If you have it divided into pieces, 1 be plus 1, another minus 1 will be as big as everything, and there will be no global magnetization. That's right. But that's not the way things work, generally. I mean, you can have, you can have such a thing with, if you change boundary conditions, but I'm, I'm not going to uh, get into that. You can have phase separation and things like that. Uh, so, <coughs> so this is the magnetization. Now the transition temperature is the temperature in between high and low temperature. It's generally speaking, not always, it's a unique temperature, believed to be a unique temperature. And uh, it's called a critical temperature. And at this point, the magnetization vanishes. That's the nature of a second order transition. The magnetization should vanish. And the correlation length uh, should be infinite. So the, the spins don't completely order, but there's, they don't act decay exponentially either. And it's at this special temperature, which is you can think of, uh, if you're thinking of a physical system, as a, a liquid gas transition. Liquid being the ordered, the gas being the disordered uh, transition. And what we want to understand 
is what happens in the neighborhood of this critical temperature. The qualitative nature of these, of these spins or gases or whatever you, you have uh, is remarkably independent of the details of how these systems interact. That is universality. So let me put this on the, on the board, on the screen. So in the low temperature mode, there's no dependence on distance at all? Or? Well, there is, but it's very, well, there, it, it depends on how you have it set up. But roughly speaking, the spin spins are mostly aligned. And, and it gets, um, uh, as they're, when they're very close, they tend to be lined up, uh, maybe not so much, but farther away. Uh, well, sorry, when they're very close, they're even more lined up. But farther away, the point is that they still remain aligned at long distances. So that macroscopically, they're all more or less pointing in the same direction. You can have little islands where they, where they uh, turn around. But this is, at very low temperatures, this is nearly one, which is the maximum this, this thing can take, basically. So now here's the universality hypothesis. This is, this is a, a, a explained in a very general way. We'll get more concrete in a moment. Um, first of all, there's a singularity. Well, you can see a singularity here. This, I mean, if I write it this way, the length has become infinite. And uh, the magnetization below TC is zero. So this magnetization goes up, and it has a singularity at TC. Uh, but the singularity at TC and the scaling limit, in other words, the long distance behavior of spin-spin correlation, not just spin-spin, but multi-spin correlations, if you look at the asymptotic long distance behavior, all these things are supposed to be independent of the details of the model. What is the constant in this What order of the constant? What's this new, this new here? Uh, sorry, where, which are you referring to? constant in front of T minus Ah, uh, there's a constant here. This constant is, let's, let's call it of order unity. I, 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 it, yes, it varies. It, it can vary from system to system. There is a prefactor here, which is very system dependent. So I didn't uh, put that in. Uh, perhaps I should have. This, there's, a, there's a prefactor, which is, uh, which is not universal. Okay. It's, it's not zero, but it is not universal. But the, what the point is that the way this, this length, for example, which I've tried to explain here, the way this diverges, the rate at which it diverges, this is supposed to be universal. In other words, it really doesn't much matter what the details of the system are. And these things were first observed, I would say, uh, I, I imagine they were first observed in physics where one did experiments to measure things like specific heat and so forth. And people noticed that although this temperature was, is model dependent, this, this TC is by no means universal. It, it's very, uh, it varies from one system to another. But the divergence, this length here, uh, at, at the way it diverges at this temperature, that's Universal. You have a question, or pointer. Pointer. Okay. Maybe that's better. I'm not used to these, but yeah. Okay. So now, uh, when I say universality, I should really be make a couple of uh, points here. It's independent, I say, as I say, of the details of the model, but it does depend upon a number of things, which are important, and one cannot neglect. And this is only a partial list of things it does depend upon. So when I say it doesn't depend upon details, there are certain things it does depend upon. First of all, and probably most importantly, the dimension of the space. If, if I have a magnet in, or if I have a, a liquid film, or, or a full uh, three-dimensional liquid, or if I imagine do, if I could do experiments in higher dimensions, uh, then the dimension of the space will change, uh, will change the uh, singularities that one sees. It will change. Uh, uh, it will change the long distance behavior. So dimensional space is of primary, a, a primary importance, as we'll see. Symmetry of the system is extremely important. Generally speaking, when I'm talking about these spin systems here, these have a, a symmetry, which is a Z2 symmetry. If you flip all spins up and you make them all down, the energy remains the same. So that's a Z2. Some symmetries, if you look, about, look at uh, superconductivity, there's a U1 or O2 symmetry. Uh, sometimes you have an SU2 higher symmetries. There are ZP symmetries. These symmetries also 
are extremely important and, and generally speaking, affect these exponents and the long distance behavior. The interaction should be short range. In other words, the interaction which, uh, which couples the system and at the Hamiltonian level shouldn't be too long range. Uh, short range is uh, perhaps too strong a word. You can't have very long distance uh, behavior. That's not to say that something like a Coulomb can't be treated, but Coulomb uh, and a short range interaction will give you different, uh, will give you different uh, physics. Finally, uh, uh, something which is sometimes uh, forgotten is that your interaction, the things that you look at, the, your, the laws of physics should be translation invariant. So if I look at a sample here and here, the, 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 uh, the interaction should not change. So let me begin by um, giving you the simplest, perhaps artificial example of universality and, and critical phenomena. And uh, it's a, a funny way of writing the uh, central limit theorem, but I will explain it in this context because it might be, you might find it useful. So imagine that we have a random walk on a, on a d-dimensional lattice and the walk starts at zero. Now, if I talk about random walks, there's generally speaking no notion of temperature. I'm going to introduce a, a fake temperature. It's, uh, it's uh, as part of a generating function here. And in the generating function, I call it gt of x. I just sum over t to the minus n, the probability that the uh, walk at, at the nth step has the value x, where x is also in cd. Okay. Now, it's easy to see that um, since the probability can't be bigger than 1, this converges for t bigger than tc. Okay. tc equals 1 is, in this case, my critical temperature. I mean, there's no real critical temperature here, but for the purposes of, of exposition, this is um, quite useful. There is a singularity at tc in this sum, generally speaking. So let's see what happens. This sum can be explicitly uh, done. And it is basically the Green's function of minus Laplacian with some coefficient, depending upon the details of how the walk, the random walk, is set up, plus uh, t minus tc. Well, tc here is 1. So if the temperature is above 1, you need it to, be a, to make the thing converge. We just have a Green's function of a Laplacian with a mass. I think of this as being the mass. And if you're at tc, the, the, uh, this difference is uh, Sorry, this difference is zero, and the Green's function decays like x to the minus d over 2. And that's more or less independent of the details of how the walk is set up. Uh, and uh, at t, that's at tc. Now, for t not equal to ctc, this thing decays exponentially fast because of this killing factor. And it decays with a length which is t minus tc to the minus a half power. So the length uh, is, uh, is divergent. As it, as it should be, with this new equal to a half here. And the scaling limit for, of course, random walks in great generality, uh, it, the, the, the steps of the walk don't have to be independent, but you have to have some asymptotic independence. And then the, the, um, uh, the scaling limit here is going to be Brownian in motion, which has all kinds of additional symmetries that is not present in the original random walk. So this is perhaps the simplest example of universality. The central limit theorem is a very simple and uh, uh, useful example of universality. Is the capital D of the Green's function little d? This, this, this d here? And the Green's function, yeah. That's like a diffusion constant. Oh. So how do things depend on the dimension? They don't really depend upon dimension except right here. So you assume some distribution of probability. Yes, and the, and the details of the probability distribution I, I'm not going to get into. And, and, and the point is, they may affect this constant d, but they will not, and they may affect this constant c, but they will not affect this d minus 2. And they will not affect this uh, power half. Again, as a prefactor, which I've omitted, it, may, it will definitely affect this. Okay. So, so the singularities and the long distance behavior are, are, um, are what's universal here, as long as it's a random walk in any reasonable sense of the word. Now, let me turn to the icing model. Um, maybe I'll come back to this, because I don't think I need this right now. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that later. So the icing model, where I want to make this spin, uh, this, is the, this is the classic example of uh, 
of a model in statistical mechanics. And um, it's a more precise version of what I was telling you uh, at the start of the talk. We have spins, which take values plus and minus 1. They're labeled by uh, points in the, in the lattice. And I, I stick in the, to a big box uh, so I can uh, make sense of some of my sums. And I define an interaction or an energy for a spin configuration. You look at any spin configuration, and you give it an energy. First, imagine this epsilon here is 0. We'll, we'll, um, uh, we'll add perturbations later to show that things don't matter, that epsilon isn't important. But for the moment, imagine epsilon to be 0. And what all this does is it, it favors, you can see your Hamiltonian is smallest, is your energy is lowest, when all the spins are aligned. They are all either all plus or all minus. I have summed here over what are called nearest neighbor lattice sites, so they should be adjacent lattice sites. And, uh, and if your spins are not aligned, then your energy increases. Okay, so if the spins are sort of random, then that ener this energy gets very large. And when I exponentiate it here, that's highly suppressed. So let me come back. So this f is, let's say, um, uh, a perturbation where you don't have nearest neighbors. It could have four spin interactions. It's, uh, it's, it should be short range. And this is what I mean by short range. The, the decay is a function of j minus k. That's a translation invariance, which I have to insist upon. And then the k of r decays, let's say, exponentially fast. I could put any prefactor here I wanted to, as long as I have some kind of exponential decay. Exponential decay isn't even necessary. You need some fast power law. If your power law is too slow, then, then universality will, will fail. So uh, the, the power law, it should just imagine it's exponential for simplicity. And then we form what's called the partition function, which is a generating function, if you like. You look at the energy of the, con of the spin configuration. You exponentiate it. This is the Gibbs weight. And you divide by the temperature. Divide by the temperature. So see, if the temperature is very, let's say, is very low, that means that this is, um, this is a small number. That means that this, the effects of the Hamiltonian are uh, at low temperature. You want, this to mini you want to minimize the energy. Otherwise, you get a very small contribution. And when you minimize the energy, all the spins want to point in the same direction. And therefore, the sigma j's are all ordered. They're all either all up or basically all down in the limit that the temperature goes to 0. And at positive temperature, there are just fluctuations around that. And again, if the temperature is high, that means t is very large, then the effect of this uh, Hamiltonian is, is, uh, is very uh, is negligible. If this t is large, it just divide, you're dividing by a large number. And then the spins are just basically just take values plus and minus 1. So you get a random sequence of, of numbers. Uh, with, um, and, uh, and so uh, these spins, uh, the spin at 0 and the spin at x, don't know about each other. And they decay basically exponentially fast. And of course, it's at the intermediate temperature where the transition takes place. Now, uh, th there's a, a famous um, solution to this problem that was um, given by Lars Onsager in, um, come over here, by Lars Onsager in, uh, uh, in the 40s. And what he was able to do, among other things, was to compute the uh, partition function. So here, epsilon should be 0, as I said. So this would just be nearest neighbors. Epsilon should be 0. And then basically, he showed this whole Ising spin system, this whole sum and uh, partition function, could all be computed explicitly, explicit computations. And I'll explain a little bit about uh, uh, the mathematics behind that uh, later, if I have a chance. So. Uh, so now, uh, and then he showed there was a phase transition, and he computed everything about it, basically. I mean, it's nothing. Uh, there are some details which are actually still open, but basically, he completely solved the model in two dimensions, and it was a real tour de force. So, um, so uh, to explain um, uh, the phase transition here, let me uh, do something else, which is to compute what's called the free energy. 
which means I take the partition function, in other words, this generating function here, you sum over all the spin configurations weighted, uh, divided by temperature, this. and then you take the log, because the thing grows, as the volume gets big, this thing grows exponentially, so you should take the log and divide by the volume, and take the limit as the volume goes to, the, uh, to Z2, and this is, uh, this is the thermodynamic limit, and this limit exists in, under great generality. It's not, uh, this is called a free energy, and uh, it depends upon epsilon. As I say, he, he computed the case of, of epsilon equals zero. Now, uh, here is the, um, here's what Ansager discovered, that for epsilon equals zero, this f of t is analytic as a function of temperature. The variation in temperature is completely smooth, except when t is equal to tc, which can depend upon epsilon. But, uh, but he only treated the case epsilon zero. Um, and at t equals tc, uh, there's a singularity. The singularity is captured, is, uh, can be seen in the second derivative. And the second derivative has a log divergence. Okay. And the spin-spin correlation has a, um, uh, has a divergence. He also uh, calculated that. The length is t minus tc to the minus 1. And if you remember, for random walk, we found it was a minus a half. So this is a little different. Um, and what uh, uh, Pinson, Haru Pinson, and I have recently done is to show that all of Ansager's results, uh, not surprisingly, uh, go through when I have a small perturbation of almost any kind, as long as it's reasonably local and even, something like this would be fine. And uh, so this is, but the temperature changes, okay? These constants change. We can't compute these constants, but we know that the singularities, and that this is a prefactor here which changes, but this singularity, this one, this log, are unchanged. So the singularity is the same. Uh, we need to require, unfortunately, that this epsilon is small. I mean, this is for a numerical result. No, no. This is a rigorous result. For a rigorous result. It's a rigorous. See, e so there's an exact solution for epsilon equals zero. That's Ansager. For the onion, I mean for, for k, in, for arbitrary k. Yeah, for arbitrary k, we can do this provided the epsilon is small and the k has some exponential decay. So there's a rigorous result that says that even though we can't solve the model exactly, it's no longer integrable for epsilon positive. It's still, the integrability captures all the singularities that Ansager saw, and there's no difference. And the fact that these singularities don't change is universality. It's a form of universality. Okay, the, the critical temperature depends only on epsilon and not on this. Oh, it does. It depends upon epsilon, and it depends upon k, and it depends upon a host of things. Absolutely. It depends upon k depends upon all the details of f, but I've only indicated the, the fact that it has an epsilon dependence, so I don't have to keep too many other indices. Okay, yes, Lisa. Yeah, well, this is two dimensions, so you have to look at certain films. I, I imagine it can be done. I wouldn't want to say for sure. <laughs> I know, that, I know that, that it has been done for spins which take continuous values, and then this is, this is all a bit different. So you have an O2 symmetry. And they've done experiments on liquid helium films. And then they agree very, very well. Uh, no, this is O2 model. O2. So it's a, like a superfluid film. Do you have universality in that case? Yes. 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 At the, well, at the, at the what's called the Cosmos-Dallas edge, there's universality. But let me not get into that. So let, let me stick with a simple case here. And uh, uh, so as I say, what's universal are these, uh, 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 how the lengths diverge, uh, uh, how this, the, the asymptotic behavior of spin-spin correlations, and so forth. Now, um, let's see, there's more to put up here. But let me go to high dimension now. I've, I've talked about two dimensions, and I said we understand high dimension reasonably well. So let me tell you what we understand about high dimension. So high dimension means bigger than five. Actually, four can also be done, and, uh, but things are a little bit different. And here you get the t minus tc to the half power, just as you did in random walk. The spin-spin correlation behaves like x over d minus 2, the fundamental solution of the Green's function. So that's just like random walk as well. This is also for epsilon zero. This is, this is for any, this is epsilon positive. 
any uh, any uh, any interact. Uh, yeah, uh, it can be done for epsilon positive. It's very general here. Epsilon doesn't have to even be small in the in the case. So well, no, it actually actually. It, I, let me not be too precise about the values of epsilon. Um, but there's a whole range, there's a very wide range of epsilons for which uh, one knows all these things. The, the, the multi-spin correlations that I've written here, a four-spin correlation, the x's are, let's say, all far apart from each other. They factor into products of pairs. That's the Gaussian nature, that, that higher endpoint correlations factor into just pair correlations. So this, the problem is very, very simple. And here you have a couple of extra permutations. Uh, now, there's, now, the spin-spin correlation, which I didn't uh, tell you about in the IC model, has also been computed. And I, and I just mentioned it back here. You see, instead of being d minus 2, it's just uh, x to the quarter. This was computed by Ansager when epsilon equals 0. Uh, we have not yet, but I, I think it's only a matter of time before somebody uh, proves that this quarter also doesn't change with epsilon. Yes, again, d equals 2. This is back, I'll come back to here for d equals 2. Just to compare the quarter here with a d minus 2 over here. This is for d bigger than 5. This uh, black stuff is for d. So you see, if you substitute d equals 2 here, you won't get the right answer. This is a quarter. Okay, so this is only valid for d bigger than or equal to 5. Actually, 4 also works. But in four dimensions, there is a correction to here, which is kind of interesting, which is a log t minus tc to the one quarter power, or one third power, or one sixth, I forget. There's a fractional power of a log which appears here in four dimensions. So it's not quite the same as the five. There's a, there are logarithmic corrections. And this is one of the, I think, one of the impressive um, uh, achievements of renormalization group. These are all done by renormalization group methods. For epsilon equals zero, there's no renormalization group. It's, it's exact solution, but for uh, but for epsilon not e uh, for epsilon not equal to zero, we use renormalization group methods. Many of these fine details you need renormalization group methods for as well. You say for g large g, you have exact solution. Also. No, you don't have an exact solution, but you know everything about the system. It's related to the fact that the self-avoiding walks. Are yes, it's, yes, that's a good point. It's related to the fact that if I have self-avoiding walks, or if I have Brownian paths. Uh, Brownian paths in d bigger than four uh, dimensions don't cross. And so there's really very little interaction in the system in high dimensions. So, so systems in high dimensions are, are not so exciting. Uh, 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 at, least if, uh, at least in these in this kinds of spin systems. Can you extend these non-existent proofs in five-fourth field theory to the d equal four case? Well, it's very much connected. The, the, uh, the, the methods that are used here are very much connected to field theory. That's, that's certainly true. And in fact, let me just comment that the results that, that Pinson and I have for epsilon small really are almost, well, they're, uh, they're a simpler version of field theoretic methods that were used by Gavensky and Kupianen, for example, to understand uh, field theories like gross neveu in two dimensions. So although the models are completely different, the methods are, are very, very closely related to, to field theoretic ones. But this is a simpler example, I would say. I mean, our, our techniques are, sl are a little bit simpler than they are in, 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 the, in the field the theoretic context for gross neve, for example. Now, I want to go to a continuum model just to, just to change speed a little bit. And since this is also a section in PDE, let me uh, put this up. Uh, now, I, I guess it's my turn to come over here. Um, and talk about an, a coupled anharmonic oscillators. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's visible. So, uh, so this sounds like a completely different topic, but in fact it's the same, uh, disguised. Uh, I have uh, a bunch of, um, uh, these are just derivatives. This is a, a Laplacian, and I'm taking n harmonic oscillators, and here they're anharmonic actually because I have a, a fourth power, x to the fourth. It has two wells. It has, uh, it has xj, uh, xj equals b, xj equals minus b. That minimizes this, so there are two wells. So it's a double well anharmonic oscillator, and they're, all, they're not independent because they're coupled by nearest neighbors. Okay. Now notice that when lambda gets very near one, lambda gets big, xj is plus or minus b approximately. Xj is 
plus or minus b. You should think of that as like plus or minus spin system. Now, what is the analog of free energy? Well, I take the lowest eigenvalue of this uh, differential operator, which depends upon n, so I've indicated here. Z zero means it's the lowest eigenvalue, and it depends upon this parameter b. And we take the limit, as n goes to infinity, now this eigenvalue uh, depends upon n in a linear way, so we divide by n, take the limit as n goes to infinity. And then uh, the statement is, for in two di well, this is, a, this is a chain, so the statement is uh, that for lambda very large, this lambda right here, very big, there exists a beta critical. The second derivative of this has a log singularity, just as it had in the icing. The, uh, the energy gap is beta minus beta critical. That's like, uh, uh, that's like this minus 1 that we saw in, uh, in the correlation length divergence. So there's a 1 here, the first power I haven't put it in. But that 1 is like the, the, uh, the 1 in the correlation length divergence. Now, if you do the same thing in higher dimensions, in other words, this, this index i lies on the lattice of dimension bigger than 4 then you get b minus b critical to the half. So this is very closely related to the icing model. So what are en0 and en2? Yes, sorry. E0n is the lowest energy eigenstate for this. Okay. It's, not a, it's a linear problem. It's a linear problem with a double well. Okay. So it's a set of coupled anharmonic oscillators. It has a ground state. And the two here, that represents the, uh, the second excited state, not the first, the second excited state. And the difference between the first and the second excited state behaves like B minus B critical for B near B critical. So for example, the di the, the, if B is not equal to B critical, there's a gap between the, second, the lowest and the second eigenstate. But as B equals B critical and N goes to infinity, I should have said had a limit here, N goes to infinity, the, the, this, this gap, this difference between the lowest eigenstate and its second excited state goes to zero at beta critical. Okay. So the, the, lowest, the lowest state is absolutely, absolutely symmetric state. Yes, that's right. And then there's a second excited state. They are, they are yes. Symmetric. Right. I should have a limit here. N goes to infinity. In other words, the, I have to take the limit that N gets very large for this result to hold. Because if I don't, then there's always a gap between the first and second excited states, because it's a compact operator. So it has a compact resolvent, rather. So this is, this is in the limit that n gets large that you get this, uh, this uh, uh, singularity. In other words, the, the, the energy levels uh, come, close, come closer and closer together if my b is close to beta critical. So these are very closely related to, to icing. Hmm? Yeah, there is a scaling limit for this, and the scaling limit is the phi to the fourth field theory. It's really the same. So we can show this. I mean, one of the problems is we can prove all this if lambda is large. It should be true when lambda is e even small. Okay? All this stuff should hold for lambda small. But our methods are perturbative, and so we can't, uh, we can't treat that case yet. Sorry. Yes? Uh, the zeroth is the lowest eigenstate. It's also the first eigenstate. Sorry, it's the, uh, I'm sorry. That's, that's maybe physics notation. It's the lowest eigenstate, and this is the second, the lowest eigenstate. And the next corresponds to one kink. Yeah. The one corresponds to one kink and two kinks and so forth. Yes, I think that's that's probably correct. And if lambda is equal to zero, it can't be uh, If lambda equals zero, then you get this kind of behavior, half. I mean, if you had a, it's, it's different. The, the, the minute lambda is positive, everything changes. The whole, well, everything changes the minute lambda is positive. And if you have lambda equals zero, the problem is soluble. It's a harmonic, bunch of harmonic oscillators. And then typically, you get this uh, square root behavior, it's central limit type behavior. Do, do you study especially the case of lambda tends to infinity when it's the con connection? Yeah, we do. We like to do that because, because it's easier to make the connection with icing. It's much easier to make the connection with icing. Because when lambda is large, you see, x wants to be near plus or minus b. Otherwise, it pays a penalty in the... Now, I should say, we don't... When, when, to do this, this is a problem in differential operators, if you like. 
However, uh, we do not analyze a differential operator directly. We analyze it through Feynman Cots. So you, ha you, really, need a, you need, really need functional integral approach to treat these things. You, you cannot, I mean, we cannot, and I don't think anybody's been very successful at treating this thing, especially in the limit of large n, directly at the PDE level. You need the path integrals to, uh, to control the, uh, the low energy behavior, especially near the critical temperature. It's essential. Now, let me uh, make some, uh, give you some idea about <coughs> what's special about two dimensions. <coughs> and <coughs> this, uh, this transparency may not make a lot of, mean a lot to some people, but uh, in two dimensions, there's something quite uh, remarkable that happens that was uh, essentially discovered by Ansager, but certainly not stated in this language. And the statement is, just imagine this epsilon is equal to zero for the moment, is that the partition function can be written as what I call a Grassmann integral of something which is quadratic, you have a, this phi here is a field, and another field here, which I'll explain in a second. And we're integrating over the fields. Now, if these fields were, were real numbers, which they are not, this would be a Gaussian integral. Okay. These, however, are Grassmann integrals. And the fields, which you see down here, actually are anti-commuting. This is the Ising model. Right? Ising model, yes, sorry. This is Ising model. This is the partition function for the Ising model. And at energy at epsilon equals zero, when I just have the nearest neighbor case, it is exactly representable as a kind of Gaussian integral with, uh, with a matrix up here, which is really a, a Dirac operator. And you see that at t equals tc, this matrix element vanishes. And, when I, and therefore, this, the inverse of this has a singularity. It's a, it's a, fundamental solution to the Dirac operator, and you get power laws and so forth that come out of that. It's a continuous model. It's this, a is a, this is a discrete model. Actually, this is the continuous limit I've written here. Uh, but this D is that there's a, there's a more explicit formula, which is a discrete Dirac operator. But its continuum limit and, and its long distance behavior really is very well approximated by this. So there's an explicit formula. and. Uh, and the, the point is that, uh, that this enables you to do all kinds of calculations. In other words, it's the analog of Gaussian integration, except that, it's, except that these guys anti-commute and psi squared equals zero. However, you notice that the integral, this, this integral can be computed exactly. And if you were doing it in a Gaussian theory, you would get a determinant to the minus one half power. What we get instead is the Fafian, which of course is closely related to the determinant. So this fact that this is a Fafian when epsilon equals zero uh, means that we can do virtually all computations almost as if they're a Gaussian. There are various sign changes one has to keep track of. And of course, the operator that goes behind that sits in here is not a second order operator as we have in Laplacian or as we have in random walk. It's a first order operator. And that changes the nature of, of, uh, of uh, the critical phenomena. The fact that this is a first order rather than a second order operator, as we would have in, in uh, random walk, for example, which is generated by Brownian motion. Or uh, generated by, has a generator which is Laplacian. So that's a second. This is a first order operator, the other one's uh, second. So that's, that's part of the, uh, that's, 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 that's one of the main mechanisms that we have. OK, now I realize my time is uh, perhaps almost gone. Uh, but let me mention a couple of other models, which are uh, Related to cellular automata, I'll just have a few few minutes to say something about this. So this is a uh, this. There are more conjectures here than there are uh, real theorems, but that makes it uh, I think interesting to look at. I'll put everything up at once since my time is running out. This uh, last two transparencies are really to try to explain how things like icing models may be related, presumably are related, to dynamical problems. And they're very simple dynamical problems to state and understand. <clears throat> this is what's called majority vote and noise. <clears throat> here, uh, 
Here we have spins which have a time dependence in addition, and we have a discrete time. So uh, the spin at time uh, uh, t plus 1 is related to the spin at time t. And what it does is it, to figure out what it's going to do at time t plus 1, it looks to itself and its four nearest neighbors and, and uh, looks at what they have to say. If you are plus and your four nearest neighbors are minus, then according to this rule, you would flip to minus. Uh, if you're all, uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're plus and you have uh, two other neighbors who are also plus, then you will remain plus. And this happens with probability one minus delta. And then, so you're voting according to yourself and your four nearest neighbor majority. And then, and then at, at uh, so you do this with the probability one minus delta. This would be completely deterministic if delta were zero. And then, and then now you, once in a while you make an error. You don't, re, you, don't you even haven't counted right or something. And, uh, and you get this, and you just put plus and minus one randomly. Okay? And you do this, you, you update sequentially, all these probabilities are independent. And you try to understand, uh, you start, let's say, with all pluses to begin with, and you, you try to understand what happens, what, what happens with noise. And, uh, and what's maybe a little surprising is that for, if you do this in one dimension, uh, there's a unique invariant measure, which means what? It means that if I started with all pluses, or I started with all minuses, and I look at the thing for very, very long times, I will not know which data I started with. The noise takes over the system. No matter how small. No matter how small. Okay. Unless it's zero. <laughs> then, of course, then of course you remember everything. <laughs> and if you, start with all, if you start with pluses, you will remain plus forever. And you start with minuses, you will remain minus forever. But the minute you introduce the noise, it will destroy your memory of what the initial data was. And that is reflected in the fact that there's a unique mixing and variant measure for all delta positive. Okay. GAC is a person? Yes. GAC is a person. CA? CA is cellular automata. Okay. So, the, so this is the D equals one uh, result for the majority vote. Now if I have a noisy cellular automata but, and I can make the rules as I like, if I have a freedom to make the rules, but my rules should not be very long range, should be short range rules and translation invariant, then then a rather surprising things can happen, which are quite different from this. Peter Gotch at Boston claims, and uh, it's a very difficult proof, that, that he can find noisy cellular automata, uh, in other words, put the noise in something like this, for which you have infinitely many, in fact, uncountably many invariant measures. That means that you remember your initial data. I mean, you want you allow obviously cellular automata of this particular? Uh, the, the gotcha, he, oh, no. This is, this is particular for this particular. Not known for general. It's not, not known for general. No, it's known to be false. There is a... It's certainly not true in general. But, but, but equal one is not account the examples. When it's not account the examples, but equal one, yeah, it's not true in general. Yeah, it's not true in general. Probably they have an integrable cellular automata there, yeah, in physics. Well, integrable would mean, uh, and, and these problems would mean that you have an invariant measure which you understand exactly, and, and there are such things, certainly. There are such things. Yeah. So now let me go to two dimensions. Two dimensions. Uh, where is it? Well, two dimensions over here. I already have it on the, on the screen. Uh, for delta small, there, the conjecture, there are two invariant measures. This is still not known, as far as I know, except in very special cases of, of special specially adapted noise. So that, that depends upon the, the initial conditions. You get two invariant measures which uh, are sensitive to your initial condition. All pluses remain plus, all minuses remain minus. This seems like an obvious fact. It's not unfortunately obvious. I, I thought I could, uh, I thought it would be easy to prove. I spent a, a few days thinking about it and, and people have spent a lot longer than I have. And it's apparently a difficult problem, although it's intuitively clear that it happens. It's certainly true numerically. Now, here's the conjecture that brings us back to icing. That at the critical, see, there's a, if your noise, there's a critical noise. If your noise is very strong, everything becomes disordered. If your noise is weak, then, the, uh, then of course, you should have some kind of order. 
And uh, the conjecture here is that at the critical noise, there's a unique measure, which is basically like the two-dimensional icing model at the critical temperature. And the general problem that we would, uh, that is very difficult in general, but I, I put it up here because it is, I believe, a, a very important problem in statistical mechanics to understand properties of the invariant measures for stochastic PDEs, which this is a very baby model for. Uh, there are models like Hadar Parisi Zhang. And to what extent there is universality? Like, well, here I'm asserting this, there's some universality, that you get back icing at TC. These are just conjectures, but I think, uh, I think these uh, problems with dynamics are one of the more interesting ones that are wide open in statistical mechanics. And part of the reason is because we don't have the measure in our hand. We don't have it explicitly. It's only determined implicitly by the, by the dynamics and, and the noise. So I will stop there. All right.